we are continuing our study of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. The woman who received back their dead. For the last two weeks, we saw two Old Testament women. The, the, the widow, the, the foreign, foreign uh, Gentile widow, as well as the Shunammite woman. But today, we are looking at a case in New Testament about 30 years before. This letter to the Hebrew was penned. John chapter 11, the account of resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, they lived in Bethany, which is about 1.5 miles east of Jerusalem. From the Jerusalem, you look at east, and there's a Mount of Olives. Right behind, up over the hill, is the small town of Bethany. In this town of Bethany, three people, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, all different personality. Martha was the oldest child, very responsible, taking care of everybody's need, always taking charge. And then Mary, more sensitive, even spiritually alert and sensitive. Lazarus, there's not a word of Lazarus recorded in the scripture. It seems like he was a man of few words, like many of us. Man of few words. But Jesus loved them each. When Lazarus fell ill, the sisters sent the word, verse 3, Lord, the one you love is sick, they meant Lazarus. But verse 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and his, her sister as well as Lazarus. It's not just Lazarus, the man. Jesus loved Lazarus' two sisters, Martha and Mary. What does that mean? Not only Jesus loved Lazarus, Martha and Mary, Jesus loved each one of us as we are. No matter what kind of circumstances you are facing, no matter what kind of background you come from, Jesus loved each one of us individually. Jesus loves us. No matter what we are facing, you know, last Sunday, as we look at the Shunammite woman upon the death of her son, this great crisis, she knew it wasn't time to be shaken. It wasn't time to be overcome with fear or grief or complain about God's goodness. How could God allow this kind of disaster to happen to me, to, to us? She knew this was time to seek God. So no matter what we are facing, we must realize God loves each one of us with his unchanging, everlasting love. As God loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, God loves each one of us. And then, the way his love is expressed to us at times, we can't fully understand. Sometimes the way God's love is expressed to us, you know, it's uncomfortable. Why? Hebrews chapter 12 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. God disciplines those he loves and he punishes, chastises those he loves as sons. Meaning, when we are walking in disobedience, God will bring discipline and chastisement, which is not pleasant. But we must nevertheless understand this is an expression of God's love. That God will not just leave us alone, but God is involved with us because he loves us. The branches that are capable of bearing great fruit are rigorously pruned. When a tree, good tree is planted, and when there's a potential of bearing wonderful fruit, it will be rigorously pruned so that only few branches will bear wonderful fruit. This is not enjoyable to us, rather painful season if God is indeed bringing his pruning shearers upon our lives. But in the end, God will grant fruitfulness in our lives that will bring glory and pleasure and honor unto him. So we come to realize in today's scripture, God allows pain and suffering in the lives of his beloved children. You know, where Jesus was staying with his disciples 
Mary and Martha send somebody that Lazarus lay ill and Lazarus about to die. So Jesus would come quickly to pray for him for bringing healing. They expected that Jesus will hurriedly travel to Bethany. You know, when you read uh, the book of the Gospels, Jesus spent minimum three Passover, including the Passover that Jesus was crucified. It could be four Passover in Jerusalem. Whenever Jesus came to Jerusalem for Passover, he probably stayed at Bethany at Lazarus' house, which is just 1.5 miles right outside the gate. So if Jesus, oftentimes, whenever he came to Jerusalem, if he stayed at Lazarus' house, he was very close to Lazarus, as well as Martha and Mary. As well as any other disciples, Jesus was you know, known to them, and they were familiar with who Jesus is. So if Jesus was informed that Lazarus lay ill, in his bed, the sisters expected that Jesus will come right back to Bethany. But Jesus didn't go. Think about this. If Jesus ran to Bethany and prayed for Lazarus, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Think about the times of waiting. Martha and Mary sent somebody to where Jesus was. Probably it was a day's journey. The second day, the man came back. Where's Jesus? Well, I guess he must be coming behind me. They are waiting and waiting, and Lazarus is dying. Can you imagine the agony? Why isn't Jesus coming? Why isn't Jesus? Mary, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, stop bleeding. And then they're wailing and they cry. And according to the customs of the Jews, somebody is dead, and within that day, before the sun down, you want to wrap him in burial cloth and, and bury him. So people in the neighborhood came and covered him in burial cloth and they carried him out. And they, they, as they carried him out, Mary and Martha following this funeral procession, crying and wailing and weeping. And they, they put inside this cave with a stone in front. And the family comes back to their house it's empty. Lazarus is gone. And the sadness and sorrow. If Jesus had been there, he could have prevented this sorrow and sadness and all this pain. But he didn't. Verse 6. When Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. How unusual. Jesus loved Martha and her sister as well as Lazarus. But when he heard Lazarus lay sick, rather than running over to Bethany to pray for his healing, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days until Lazarus dies. He abstained from traveling to Bethany, to Lazarus' house, not because he did not love them, but precisely because he loved them. He allows Lazarus to die. Why? He is allowing Mary and Martha to experience this sorrow and sadness. And Jesus has some deep wisdom and love in store. Think about why God would allow trials, painful trials and hardship upon believers' life. There are certain virtues of our faith that are only shaped within and as we go through trials and painful process where would be faith without trial last week we examined the story of the death of Shunammite son Shunammite woman lady's son and then through the death of her son her faith shined in the crisis where would patient be if there was nothing to wait, nothing to bear under? Where would our character, where would our experience be if there's no tribulation? So scripture says, Hebrews chapter 5, although he was a son, Christ learned obedience through what he suffered. It wasn't as if Jesus was lacking anything, but because 
he became a man, just like all of us, and as a representative, the second Adam, the perfect Adam, who is to fully obey God's ways, he suffered. And through the suffering, he continued to obey the Lord. So he fulfilled disobedience through suffering. We can enjoy the fruit that comes in the autumn, but it must go through the wintry storm as well as, as the scorching heat of the summer. Without the winter cold wind and, and scorching heat and the drought of the summer, we will not have the sweet fruits in the fall. In much the same way, in terms of shaping of our faith and our character and our Christian journey, Lord Jesus allows us hardship and trial and suffering where our own proud self-sufficiency, self-reliance, we let go. And we say, Lord Jesus, we need you. We can't do it with our knowledge and our experience and our strength. Lord, we need you. That kind of humble dependence is, is shaped through our suffering and through our trials. So suffering prunes away the leaves in which we enjoy so that the sap, the energy may be channeled into the fruit. There are some things in our lives that are not wrong, not sinful. We can enjoy, but sometimes God will prune and these branches and these leaves will fall off so that all the energy and resource will be channeled into the fruit that will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. And this is what God allows through suffering. So think about three benefits of the pain and suffering in Christian life. Number one, pain causes us to seek God. Pain drives people to seek the Lord. When Lazarus was healthy, nobody was hurriedly seeking Christ. Martha and Mary knew that Jesus was carrying on public ministry of preaching the kingdom and healing the sick. He was traveling not only Judea, but Galilee and everywhere. So they knew Jesus' busy schedule. They let him be. Because whenever Jesus traveled to Jerusalem, they will come and stay with them. But when Lazarus fell ill, they sent somebody, go somewhere, find where Jesus is, and let him know that Lazarus lay ill. When there was a crisis, Martha and Mary had to seek after where Jesus was. You know, when tsunami comes, the huge wave will just lift up houses, big trucks, trees, whatever. The wave carries everything in our lives. The tsunami of hardship, painful suffering, lifts us up from our place of comfort and complacency. And, and this wave of suffering and trial, crisis, brings us at the foot of the cross so that we say, Lord Jesus, we need you. In times of crisis, in times of painful suffering, that's when we are driven to seek Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 8, Noah's flood, after the rain stopped, Noah waits a couple weeks, and then he opens the window. He sent out the raven. Raven doesn't come back. Why? Raven will feed on you know, dead bodies. Raven loves debris and, and garbage and trash and dead bodies floating. But when a dove was sent out, the dove found no place to land and it came back to Noah's hand. In much the same way, people who need to seek the Lord uh, in the world, when there's no place where they can find comfort or hope or strength. People need to return to God. So church is not a place where people who have gained success and fame and status 
come to church and show up and, and be catered to their sense of pride. No, church is a place where people who have no place to land, no place to put their foot in the ground, they are driven to church where they find welcome arm of Jesus Christ. That's what church is to be. So people who are facing hardship and difficulty with no place to turn to, they should turn to Jesus Christ here at the church. That's what church is about. So pain makes God a necessity. In the valley of the shadow of death, we are able to say, God, you are with me. You remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down by the quiet waters. He leads me to green pastures. David is speaking about God as my shepherd. Third person, singular. He leads me to the green pastures. He makes, makes me lie down by the quiet waters. But when he is in the valley of shadow of death, he says, thou art with me. When I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will not fear evil, for thou art with me. So in the valley of shadow of death, God is no longer he. It is thou, you, you are with me. So in pain and in hardship and suffering, we come to realize God is with us. Number two, there are certain aspects of God's character and God's glory which is revealed to his beloved children only through trials and suffering. Mary and Martha, they were close to Jesus because having hosted Jesus numerous times. They knew Jesus as well as anybody else. But only when their own brother Lazarus fell ill and died, that's when they discover Jesus was resurrection and life. Until then, they didn't know Jesus was resurrection and life. They knew Jesus was miracle working. They knew Jesus was sent by God. They knew Jesus could heal. But they didn't know Jesus was resurrection and life until their own brother died. David declared, not only the Lord is my shepherd, he declared, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my fortress, the Lord is my shield about me. How could he say that? Because he experienced God's special protection when King Saul was hunting him with 2,000, 3,000 specially select soldiers. King Saul wasn't fighting against the Philistines with his chosen men. Saul was going after his own son-in-law, David, because he was so insecure. He wanted to get rid of David. And David had to run away. You remember the stories? David and his men were one side of the mountain, and Saul was with his soldiers and another, and, and they will just go the other direction. One time David was inside a cave, and that's the cave Saul came in to relieve him. Remember the stories. All these near misses. But God protected David, and David was never captured by Saul. And Saul was able to say, the Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my shield. He is my rock. He is my stronghold. So in the life of believers... Whatever difficulty and, and, and hardship that we experience, even some of the things that we lack, God is causing us to lean on to him so that we will experientially learn that he is faithful, that he is indeed provider, that he is our divine help, that he is our hope, that he is our salvation. You know, when our resources run dry, that's when we experience, it's not just children of Israel. They experience manna from heaven. 
God provides my daily needs. Yes, I also experience God's provision of daily manna. When we are in the dry wilderness, when our life is dry, we experience the Lord will allow the spring of the living water gushing out of the rock. So we experience pain and suffering in our lives because pain causes us to drive and seek God. And number two, certain aspects of God's glory is revealed to us only in pain and suffering. Number three, pain often gives birth to the novelest act of sacrifice and devotion that, that will bring pleasure unto Jesus. You know, as we read on, Mary, Lazarus' sister, she will bring an alabaster jar of perfume and break that alabaster jar and pour upon Jesus. And the whole house was filled with the smell of a perfume. And some of the disciples, they were offended. Why this waste? We could have sold this expensive perfume for over 200 denarii. That's like one year's wages. This could be sold with a huge sums of money so we could help the poor. Jesus says, no, 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 let her be. She's done a beautiful thing. She has prepared for my burial. Wherever this gospel is proclaimed, what she has done will be also told that she, she will be remembered. This Mary's devotion, breaking the alabaster jar, expensive jar of perfume, and pouring upon Jesus, this was an expression of extravagant devotion, sacrifice, worship that pleases Jesus. But that came only after death of her brother and then Jesus coming and, and raising him back to life. Because of that gratitude and thanksgiving, she did not hold back anything. She broke that expensive alabaster jar and poured upon Jesus. What pleases God, what brought great pleasure to Jesus' heart, this was birth out of the painful suffering, but also revelation of Christ's glory. So there are certain things, especially sacrifice and devotion that bring pleasure unto Jesus that are birthed only through painful suffering. Now, Jesus speaks to the disciples, for your sake, I am glad I was not there at Bethany, at Lazarus' house, so that you may believe. Jesus was speaking to disciples. What does he intend for disciples to believe? Jesus allowed Martha and Mary to experience the sorrow and, and suffering of seeing their own beloved brother die. But through the death of Lazarus and through the experience of Mary and Martha's sorrow and sadness, now when Jesus comes and raises Lazarus back to life, people realize death is not the end. That Jesus Christ is resurrection and life. That all who will trust in Jesus, death is not the final end. So Jesus wanted disciples to know and believe that he is resurrection. So first of all, God allows pain and suffering to his children. Number two, God's love sometimes leaves our prayer unanswered and delayed. Even here, many of you have prayers that has not been answered. You are praying for maybe your children. You are praying for your spouse. There are prayers that you are lifting up before God. And it's not like you are lacking faith. You are fully believing that God will hear your prayer, that God will bring this person back to Jesus Christ. But the prayer is not answered yet. It's been years. You know, Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he is and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So there are many who pray day in and day out. Diligently seek him with certain prayer and God doesn't answer this prayer. Some mother praying for their wayward child and and 10 years, 20 years, God has an answer. 
you know. There are certain prayers that as you begin to pray and really diligently seek after some time, this prayer burden slowly is fading and you no longer pray for that. But God is directing you to pray for something else. But there are certain prayer focus, this certain issues that you don't let go. You are praying, and God continues to stir your heart to continue to believe and pray. If you are praying for your way or child, you don't let go. If you are praying for your spouse to have an encounter with Jesus, you don't forget. You continue to pray. You don't forget about this prayer need. God will continue to let you pray. He's not releasing you from this prayer burden. But why is he delaying this prayer? Because while God delays the answer to prayer, you become personal prayer. You become somebody whose channel of prayer is opened up. And as you continue to seek him in, in his presence and pray, you develop spiritual years and spiritual sensitivity so that not only you are praying for your spouse or your son, your communication becomes so sensitive to God. And God says, before you pray about that, you remember what you said to that person yesterday? Uh-uh. You belong to me. My child isn't supposed to say things like that. My child shouldn't think such a thoughts. My child shouldn't have such an attitude. Oh, so before this prayer, God is dealing with me about my speech or my thoughts or my attitude as somebody who prays with open heaven. God is dealing with me as spiritual watchman. If you want to have open communication with me, if you want to have this, this quick, speedy, emergency hotline with God that you say one thing that God would answer you, you also need to be sensitive to my prompting. Don't carry a grudge. Don't speak those unkind things. Apologize. Ask for forgiveness. Walk in purity. Walk in humility. Walk in gentleness. Don't say things that you just feel like saying. No. Hold your tongue. Because you belong to Jesus. And you're going to be a witness for Jesus. And you're going to pray and you expect me to answer. Be a person who speaks loving words. Be someone who will wait. Rather than bursting out in anger. God's dealing with me. To be spiritual watchman. So God will delay answer to prayer and let me continue to come to place of prayer and this long prayer becomes a time where I am trained as a spiritual watchman. Someone with spiritual sensitivity to the voice of God. That's a blessing. Besides the answer to prayer about my son or my spouse. Having this open heaven. Becoming spiritual watchman. Like the Shunammite woman. That itself is a blessing. That's why God will delay answer to prayer. So that we will come to that place of training. In that school of prayer. No praying breath is ever spent in vain. True prayer in the presence of God. Would you repeat after me? No praying breath is ever spent in vain. No genuine prayer is ever wasted. That's what it means. Your prayer doesn't fall to the ground. But angels receive this prayer in the bowl, golden bowl, and they lift up to the presence of God. This incense of prayer in the bowl is lifted up to the presence of God. That's what we read in Revelations. So prayer with open heaven, if we become spiritual watchmen, 
Not a single prayer is fall to the ground. It's carried in the golden bowl, the incense of prayer brought before God's presence. Hallelujah. So God allows pain and suffering in the lives of his beloved children. And God sometimes in his love leaves our prayers unanswered and delayed so that we will seek his presence. And during these long years of praying, we will be trained that we will have open heaven, that we will become a person who have really open communication with God, that the way we think, the way we handle our attitude, the way we speak will fit those who spent time on our knees in the presence of God. Number three, God's love is made manifest in his perfect timing. Would you repeat after me? God's love is perfect. God's wisdom is perfect. And his timing is perfect. Do you believe that? God's love is perfect. His wisdom is perfect. Then the timing that he answers our prayer is also perfect. Jesus waited two more days after he heard Lazarus is sick. And then after he knew that Lazarus died, he said, Let's go. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, Mary and Martha, they were very disappointed. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. Why didn't you come? Didn't you care about us? Didn't you love us? What does Jesus say to Mary? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. I love you. I love your sister. I love your brother Lazarus. But I waited to show you God's glory. No second messenger has come to Jesus. But Jesus knew Lazarus died. That's why Jesus said, told his disciples, hey, let's go to Bethany. Lazarus has fallen asleep. Lord, if Lazarus has fallen asleep, if he has a deep sleep, he will get well. No, 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 no. I meant he's dead. He's dead. Then why do we go? Lord, just a few weeks ago, Jews there wanted to stone you. They're going to kill you. Lazarus is dead. Why do we go? Timothy says, let us all go so we may also die with him. <laughs> they never imagined Jesus was going there to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there until Lazarus is dead, that you may believe that I am the resurrection and life. So in his perfect timing, Jesus revealed his glory that he's not just a healer, but he was resurrection and life. So brothers and sisters, Jesus would allow Pain and suffering in his beloved because pain causes people to seek after God. Certain aspect of God's glory is revealed to us only through pain and suffering. And, and the sacrifice and devotion that will please Jesus is oftentimes birth and given through suffering. And number two, God would allow prayer being unanswered. He will delay answer to our prayers because he's not just interested in answering our prayers. He's more interested in what kind of people we are becoming, that we really become a child of God who has this open communication, who become more like Jesus in our heart, in our attitude, in our speech, in our conduct. So he will delay answer to prayer so that we will continue to seek him in the place of prayer where we have this long conversation that he molds us and shapes us and, and he will deal with us so that we become spiritual watchmen. And number three, his love, his grace, 
the blessing is revealed to us in his perfect timing. Repeat after me. God's love is perfect. God's wisdom is perfect. His timing is perfect. Join me in a prayer. In your words, would you tell God, God, I will trust you even in the midst of hardship and trial. Even when I don't see the reason why, I will trust in you. Even when you are delaying the answer to prayer, Lord, I will trust in you. Even through the delayed prayer, as you cause me to seek you, Lord, I want to be someone with open heaven. I want to be spiritual watchmen who have sensitive heart to the voice of God in your